also say that he didn't have any words to go off of when he did that. Pretty good. I wish I had that kind of memory. I have mine written down. Yeah. Thank you. That tells the story. We asked him to do that because last week was Easter. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in Leviticus initially, chapter 17, verse 11, and then in 1 Peter after that. Last week was Easter. We celebrated the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. And then after that, during the week, I was at work, and a skeptic, a non-Christian, was talking to me about the fact that it had been Easter, and he said, you're a Christian, right? And you're a pastor, yeah. He said, and he made the comment that, he said, I never understood, he said, that religion of yours, Christianity, is just such a bloody faith. It's, it seems that you talk about a lot about blood. But I never understood that. Why all the talk about blood? And it got me thinking that, yes, we covered the, the death, burial, and resurrection, the passion of Jesus, and, and ultimately his resurrection. But I think it's important, before we move on with another series, that we talk about the reason for all the talk about blood, about the shedding of the blood. Where does it come from? Why is it so central to our faith that we understand the significance of the blood. So I ask you this morning, you know, Christianity, it does talk about blood. They say it's a bloody religion. Why all the shedding of blood? When you say the sinner's prayer and you ask God to be your Savior and you ask, you say, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ and the cross has this meaning for my faith in my life, why is it that that saves you? How do you gain salvation from that prayer that you say? What kind of cosmic event happens to affect you, to give you a relationship with God and eternal life? And what relationship does it have to the cross? What relationship does it have to the bleeding and the blood of Christ that we've been singing about today? You know, blood itself is a miraculous and mysterious substance. Uh, in medicine, we have a whole specialty that deals with it, hematology, and it's amazing to me still, as I study it so much on that side of things, that blood, we don't know how to make it, we can't synthesize it, but that substance is so critical to life. In fact, if you had every other vital sign normal, your blood pressure, your temperature, your pulse, your respirations, everything else in your body worked perfectly, but we just replaced the blood with some other substance. You'd be dead in two seconds. Can't live without it. We have to have it. So I ask you the question this morning, why all the talk about blood? Look at Leviticus 17, verse 11. It says here from the Old Testament now, we're going to have to go back to the Old Covenant to really get this. The Old Covenant, or the, from the Old Testament it says in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for life. So the life is in the blood. Life is in the blood, and life is where we find atonement, at one -ment, connection with God through the blood. Again, this is a sacrificial thing. The question remains, why do we have to have the blood, and why was it Jesus' blood? In Rotterdam uh, Square in Holland, there is a house called the House of Terrors. And this house stands on the corner, and it's a famous house because it dates back to the 16th century. Okay, so again, this is in Holland. 16th century when King Philip of Spain, who was an arch-Roman Catholic, had a great hatred for Protestants. And so he sent the Duke of Alva and a bunch of soldiers from Spain, some Spanish soldiers, to Rotterdam, Holland, and he said, this, is, this happened, this is a true event that happened in the 16th century. He sent his soldiers, he said, I want you to go to Holland, into Rotterdam, and seek out, go house by house, and if there are Christians living in there that are Protestants, 
I want you to pull them out and I want you to brutally kill them. Don't save the children. Kill the kids, the babies, the women. Kill them all. If they're Protestant, they die. So the soldiers came to Rotterdam, went house to house, began pulling out families and children. The screams were heard, the, the stomping of the shoulders, the marching was heard, and they began to kill the Protestants one by one, house by house. This house, the House of Terrors, as it's called in Rotterdam, there was a group of Protestants there, a family and several other members of a church There were Protestants in the house, and they were waiting and they heard the screaming of the people in the houses nearby. They heard the children scream, the, the killing. They heard the marching of the soldiers. So they knew they were coming to their house. And so one of the, the men there, the young men, got the idea. He said, what we'll do is I'm going to go outside to have an idea. So he goes out back and he brings in a lamb. It's a true story. He brings in a lamb and he slits the neck of the lamb. The blood of the lamb leaks out onto the floor. The lamb dies. And they take the, the brooms and everything they could get and they, they move the blood out on the floor under the doorstep and the blood just runs out on the porch of the house and down the steps. When the soldiers got to their house about ten minutes later, they started towards the house and they saw the blood coming down the porch and they just passed by because they said, I guess the other group has already gotten to them. They're already dead. Let's go to the next house. So they passed on by because they saw the blood of the lamb. True story. It shows us the importance that it took blood to save the life of those people. Water wouldn't have worked. Hiding wouldn't have worked. Being really smart wouldn't have worked. They were going to come in, and they were going to kill them one by one, but the blood stopped it. The blood, which came from the substitute of the lamb, prevented their death. We see this concept that only the shedding of blood saves the life of another. Otherwise, they would have been dead. Only shed blood can save us from death, and, and that's what the Bible tells us. That's the story of the whole Bible that it is the shed blood all the way back. We go back to the Jewish faith, back to the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, all the way through. It's the blood that God has been telling us that will save us. So this idea about blood, I told my colleague, is not a sideline idea for Christianity. It, it's not just maybe something we might want to mention once in a while. It's not maybe a little bit of part of the faith. It is the cornerstone. It's the central piece of the Christian faith. It's the foundational bedrock of Christianity. Yet, critics and skeptics continue to say, why all the talk about blood? It's such a bloody religion. Voltaire, a famous uh, writer, and John Adams, president, John Adams, both have made much criticism about Christianity in the past because of the bloody nature. They've written much about the bloody nature nature of the faith. It's too bloody and its founder had such a bloody death. Must it be that way? But yet, what do we sing this morning? Our hymns. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood. When we take communion, one of the elements from that sacrament represents the blood of Christ. The juice or the wine. It represents the blood of Christ, as Jesus told us to do. And we know from the Bible that it's the blood that removes our guilt and our shame and our regret and brings us forgiveness. So it's the blood. The blood. The significance of the blood atonement. I take this back then to the Old Covenant and say this is where it comes from. All this that points to Jesus all comes from the Old Covenant if you look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 18, if you have your Bible, turn to that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 18. And I'll read these words. Listen to these words of the writer of Hebrews now in the New Testament. He says, Not even the first covenant, now he's talking about the old covenant now, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when each commandment was declared by Moses... He took the blood of goats with scarlet, 
water and hyssop, and sprinkled with blood the book and the people. And then he says, under the law, everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now this is 1,800 years before Jesus was even on the scene. And we're seeing the killing of an innocent lamb, the, the sprinkling of blood on the law, so that the Ten Commandments can be inaugurated with blood. We call this the cutting of a covenant. Let me explain what that means. A covenant is a promise, whether it's the Old Covenant or the New Covenant. We live under the New Covenant, but both of these are a promise. A covenant is a contract, if you will, between one person and another that I, if you will do this, I will do this, we have this relationship, and we promise that this is the way it's going to go, right? Our, our contract, our covenant is cut. And we say that in the Old Testament it was cut with blood, as was the new one. What does that mean? The reason is, what they would do is they would take that, that lamb, that innocent animal, when they made their covenant, the promise between two people, and that, that animal would die in front of them, an innocent death, and that would tell each party in the covenant, in the contract, that if I break my promise, I will be, my result will be just like that lamb. That death of that lamb that I've watched die in front of me, if I break this promise, that will be my fate. And so they remember that, and they have a picture of that dying lamb as they go forward. It's all about how serious the situation is. It's not just a promise and then, well, uh, it didn't work out. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go another way. No, it's cut with blood because if I breach it, let me suffer the fate of the dead lamb that's soaked in blood. But you see, in our culture, this is why this guy said this to me and why critics say it, we're just so removed from the sacrificial system We've just not seen it. It's not up close. It doesn't have a deep meaning to us. And so I think we're just a little bit far removed from it to understand why Jesus had to die and why we talk about blood so much. So we go to the Exodus. So for a minute, go back to the Passover. In your mind, for a moment, go back to that event when the Israelites were in captivity. They're God's people. They're in Egypt. They're in captivity. They're slaves. They're in bondage there. And God hears their cries, let us out of this terrible life, of this terrible bondage. God hears their cries and develops a plan to get them out, the exodus. But to get there, he sends ten plagues. Remember something about this, very interesting. The first nine plagues, the frogs that infested their houses, the insects that bit them and caused infections, the hail that fell on them, the first nine plagues only fell on the Egyptians. The Israelites were protected from that. God's people didn't, weren't infested with frogs. The Israelites were around them. God's people weren't bitten by those bugs, those insects. They watched as the Egyptians were bitten and infected and died. They were okay. They were protected from that. When the hail fell, it didn't fall on the Israelite town. It fell on the Egyptian towns. They were protected from the first nine. But then comes the tenth plague. The tenth plague, God says, this one is different. Now this one is going to hit you too. You're not protected from this one, so don't get the idea that you're really more righteous than the Egyptians. You're still sinners. You're still people. But you're my people. So I've protected you. However, on this tenth one, it's going to go a little different. This one, when the angel of death flies over Egypt, firstborn of every family and the firstborn of every animal is going to die. Okay? Unless you, my people, have a way out. If you will take an innocent lamb and kill it and put the blood on the door, the angel of death will pass over. Now, why did he do that? Why... why why that blood again? Why does he have to do that? What was he trying to show? Why was that important that they did that? That they could escape the plague of death by painting the blood on the door of the innocent lamb. They didn't probably understand it at the time, but this became a powerful object lesson for them and for us today. I think it's so, so critical that we see this. So what would happen when the Israelites then would say, all right, 
let's bring the family outside tonight because tomorrow, tonight the angel of death is coming. So they brought the kids out. The father, the mother, the children stood around. And what they knew was, little Jonah here, he's going to die tonight unless we do this. If we don't do this, he's dying because they've seen the other nine plagues. So for the life of this boy, the father takes the lamb, brings it out, an innocent lamb, slits the throat, and then as that lamb stumbles around and bleeds out from its carotid artery, bleeding all over the place and stumbling about, they all stand there and watch it. it I'm sure it ran into them. The blood was all over the place. They all watch that lamb stumble and bleed to death, knowing that little Jonah was going to die if he didn't die. Now see, that's the picture that they got in their mind. It's visceral. It's gut level. They know it. They'll never forget that picture of that lamb bleeding to death in front of them. They didn't deserve to die, but it was a substitute for little Jonah or whoever the boy was, little Jewish boy. So then they go in the house. They paint the blood on the door. They go to sleep, and they all know, had it not been for that little lamb stumbling around dying, Jonah would know, I'm dead. The brothers and sisters would know, my brother would be dead were it not for the death of that lamb. So why did he do that? God did that to point to them the importance of blood, that life is in the blood. You don't have life without blood. You can have everything else you want, but if we take the blood, there is no life. And, the, and there had to be a substitute had to pay the price for your sin or you will die. He had to paint the picture for them and they had to see it so clearly in their mind that life is precious and that sin is serious and that God is holy and he has to, he cannot be in front of sin without a price paid. And the price is life. It's, it's just not something that you can find a, a simple fix for. See, the sinner in this situation is not the one who pays the penalty. The sinner doesn't die. Somebody else dies. The sacrifice of another one dies, an innocent lamb. But actually, it wasn't just the lamb. As you move forward, it was God himself who died. It, wasn't, it was just a picture of what was to come. It wasn't really just the animal. It wasn't the blood of bulls and goats that was saving them. It was a temporary sacrifice. But it was pointing to the fact that God himself would be the lamb who would die a brutal and horrible death. So why is, the, why is this death the penalty? Why not some other penalty for sin? I mean, that's another question that people ask. Why does it have to be death? It just seems so severe that you're a sinner, you're separated from God. Why couldn't God just wipe it out? Why does he have to be so brutal about it and so deadly and so bloody? Romans 3 says all men are sinners and the penalty for sinfulness is death. It, that's the penalty. That means a life spent in, in hell and apart from God, death, Ultimately, you'll die in this life and live apart from God for eternity in torment. It says, God made him who knew no sin to take on sin to take our punishment so we wouldn't have to die. See, death is a fitting consequence for, for sin, for a person. Because think about it. What is a person doing who doesn't accept God? The person who's a complete atheist, skeptic, I don't want God, I want nothing to do with God. I'm okay on my own, don't need it. Don't need you. I don't need you. What does that mean? That means the person is saying, you who gave me life, I don't need you. You who gave me life, I don't want you. Can't have life without God. Can't have life without blood. But I'm going to say, the person who's independent from God says, you might have created me. You might have breathed life into me. You might be the source of life, but what you're saying is if you don't want God, I don't want you. If you're going to say you don't want the source of life, then the penalty is death. It's a, it's a, fair, it's a fair penalty. If you want independence from the life giver, then the penalty is death. 
And so we have to have a substitute to die for us unless we want to, to accept that punishment. Now, the second thing is guilt is a universal experience that we all suffer from. We all have guilt, and that's one of the things I want to talk about today is relieving our guilt, getting rid of our guilt, because if we have put our faith in the shed blood of that lamb, we don't need guilt anymore. We don't get extra points for carrying guilt. We don't get extra points from God for feeling guilty for our past sins, our past selfishness, our past actions, thoughts, deeds that were bad. We need to let it go. That's the point of salvation. We need to be free from that. The Israelites did not remain in bondage. They were released. They went to the promised land. They left. Now, yeah, they wandered for a while to get there, but they left. They got out of bondage, and we need to be released from our bondage of guilt. No matter what we've done or what we've said or how we've acted, if we've placed our faith in Christ, we need liberation. We need freedom. And we need wholeness and healing. I talked a little bit last week about this, but just to build on it, this guilt thing. I was thinking about the universality of guilt. How, no matter what religion or no religion, everybody feels guilty. Even if they don't admit there's a God, they down deep know that they've done wrong and they feel guilty. The Jewish synagogues are generally empty all year until it comes to Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is the, the Day of Atonement, the time where people can come and confess their sins and get released from their guilt. And all of a sudden, during that week, the synagogues are full. And people are listing their sins and confessing them and seeking God's favor for release of their guilt because they feel guilty. And they know that they're not, in, in the face of God, they've done wrong. I mentioned the Hindus who make a pilgrimage to the river Gandhis to wash off their guilt with water. And they believe that that water will make them clean. And then monks who tie bands around their arms and legs and wear coats of hair that scratch their skin all the time. They're trying to find a way to atone for what they've done wrong. We all feel guilty. But the problem is, as Christians, we don't need to. We don't need to. If we're believers in Christ, if we've placed our faith in Him, He's been the substitute. The blood has atoned for your guilt. You don't need it anymore. You can live without it, and it's fine. So three things we get from this. The first is forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood. In Him we have redemption. We have we're gaining something in exchange for a debt paid. We're receiving freedom. For what? Through his blood. It's through his blood. We clear the debt. You know, somebody asked one time, why didn't Jesus just prick his finger and bleed a few drops? And say, there's the blood. I paid it. It had to be that brutal death that resulted in not just a few drops, but he had to bleed out his blood essentially bleed to death, which is what happened, and then be placed on the cross and be brutified, brutally uh, killed in a very brutal way to show the expensive nature of sin and how it separates us from God. Redemption is possible, but it's expensive. It doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come easy. Water won't do it. Holy rituals won't do it. Bulls and goats' blood won't even do it. Ultimately, it takes God himself to bleed out in a brutal death in order to gain redemption for us. And I think it's so important that we understand that as Christians. That this is just didn't come easy. It didn't come cheap. So we all have guilt. We should be relieved of it and forgiven and forgotten. Second, we need a clearing of our conscience. Blood, it says in the Bible, is cleansing. If you read various places, it says blood will cleanse. Now, normally we think blood is staining. If I, if I take blood and put it on a white cloth, it leaves a stain. But the Bible says just the opposite. Blood is cleansing. I was thinking about that, that if I take a blood pressure cuff and tighten it up as tight as I can on your arm, or very high, what will happen is very predictable. As your, blood, as your arm stops receiving blood, because I tighten it so tight, there's no blood coming into your arm. What will happen is 
you won't be getting the blood to bring oxygen to your tissues so it starts to build up toxins. Lactic acid and other things build up in your muscles and eventually you can move but you can't do it very well and then eventually you, you can't write and, and then later, a few minutes later, you can't even move your arm. You won't even be able to use your hand or your arm in about five or ten minutes or so from that being tightened because there's so many toxins in your arm and the muscles built up from not having blood there. If I release that and the blood comes in your arm, it only takes about a minute and again you can move your hand because the blood cleanses away the toxins. The blood is cleansing. The blood clears away the toxins and that's a picture. It flushes them out. Blood is cleansing. We think it causes stains, but the word is very clear that blood will cleanse us, blood will, will release us. It brings liberation. It brings freedom. It brings hope. It brings uh, our greatest fears can be put aside. It brings deliverance, ultimately. And we all need delivered from something. We all need delivered from sin, but there's other things, too, that we need delivered from. And whatever you think your problem is today, right now, that you're wrestling with, it's very interesting that I've found no matter what we might be thinking our problem is, the Bible says what we really need is deliverance, what we need is salvation, what we need is Jesus. The rest of the stuff will work itself out. But if we don't start there, our problems just tend to continue and snowball. They just don't get better. Or we get rid of one and we get a new one. But when, our, when we set our eyes here and we begin with the blood, the blood will set us free. The rest will fall into place. And I've found that to be the case. The last thing is access to God. All of us need access to God who has all the power. We all function in our life every week and throughout whatever we're doing on our human strength and we find problems with that. We fail because we can't do it perfect. We lose strength. We lose hope. We're not perfect. We have problems. We need access to God because God has all the power and all the strength. And it's the blood that gives us forgiveness of sins, that clears our conscience and takes our guilt, and three, gives us access to God and His power. This week I saw the movie Chappaquiddick. I actually went to see uh, Paul, the apostle, but we thought it was on at seven and it wasn't, so we were there, so we went to see Chappaquiddick. And just briefly, this is an illustration about power. You can't get enough power without God, no matter what kind of power you have in this world. In that movie, politics aside, it was about the Kennedy family. And it, and it illustrated to me that, that if there was ever a family who gained the world, it was probably them. They're one of them. Because they had access to all the halls of power. And when Ted Kennedy put that car over upside down in the Chappaquiddick water, went over the bridge, however it happened, he, he didn't know what to do. He didn't report it. He waited. He didn't do the right thing for sure. And he didn't know what to do. But he turned to his father who had all the earthly power. And he walks in the room in that movie and there's a room, a living room full of all the most powerful people in the world and say, Sit down, Ted, we've got to fix this. But what I noticed was they were able to get him out of some of the trouble, not all of it. He certainly never totally recovered from it. But what I noticed in the movie was, though, he never got rid of his guilt. The power that they had may have been enough to get him out of jail for a while, and maybe out of some of the trouble, although I don't think in the court of public opinion he ever really got over it. But I noticed in the movie that that character never got rid of his guilt. The power of the people that he had couldn't free him from living his whole life full of guilt and distress over that incident. The halls of Congress aren't even enough to remove your guilt and bring you access to ultimate power. That only comes from God. And we get that through the blood. Even the most powerful family remains at distance from God unless they go through Christ, 
unless they give their will over to God. Ephesians 2.13 Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You who were once far from the power have been brought into the power, have been brought access to ultimate power. You have the privilege of pouring out your hearts to God with whatever your concern is, whatever your worries are, because of the blood. The blood brings you the ability to cast your fears on God instead of carrying them yourself. The blood of Christ is our path to access to the Creator. It's the only way we can reach Him. So do we talk about blood? Absolutely. Are we ashamed of it? No. Because if it wasn't for the blood, we wouldn't have life. And if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, no forgiveness, no freedom from guilt, no freedom from bondage, no access to God, no eternity, we pay the penalty of death. Let's close. You uh, can come forward and close us in a hymn. This hymn is about fountain of blood. We're going to sing that, listen to the words. And let me pray as they're coming forward. Gracious Father, <clears throat> your blood is, uh, is what paid the price. The blood of bulls and goats are a symbol that we can have in our mind. The blood of that lamb stumbling around, bleeding, and dying. That's what it takes to save a person. We can't save our soul with water. We can't save it with a holy ritual. We can't save it by self-flesh mortification. We can't save it from making pilgrimages. We can't wash it away with water. We can't wash it away with soap. But your blood will cleanse us. Your, your blood will cleanse the toxins out of us. Your blood will give us freedom from guilt, a clearing of our conscience, access to God, and forgiveness of sins. God, it is in your blood and in your crucifixion and resurrection that we have life, that we have hope, and that we can live eternally with you, God. We thank you for that. I pray that we would have an understanding of that, and if anyone here doesn't know you that way, that they will come to know you. They will accept your, your sacrifice for them. And if we all know you, I pray, God, that we make this front and center, that it's not a, a sideline thing, that we're not ashamed to stand on the bedrock of the blood of Christ that saves us and is the cornerstone of our life. In Christ's name we pray.